Hi, I'm Susan Cotton. I'm the teacher author behind Miss Cotton's Corner. Thank you so much for joining me today for the next video in our series, 30 Days, 10 Minutes to a More Literate Classroom. Today, I wanna to talk to you about something a little different, not a reading strategy, but still something that if you spend a few minutes thinking about, you're gonna have a huge impact on your students' literacy achievement this year. Today, I wanna to talk to you about the schedule. I got my plan book the other day and opened it up. And you know that feeling at the beginning of the year when you're like, it's empty. There's so much time. It all feels so wonderful and so full of potential. And then you sit down and you start to figure it out and you start to say, okay, well, the district initiative is this and I've got to bring in that and I've got to work with the pullout schedule. And all of a sudden, all that potential starts to feel like way too little time, right? Every year, we make decisions about how we spend the time in our classroom. And that decision has such a huge impact on our students. 21 years ago, when I read the book Guiding Readers and Writers by Foundress and Pinnell, I made the decision to include independent reading as a practice in my classroom. And I have never changed that decision. I reevaluated, absolutely, and I have never changed my mind. I've done it with kindergartners and I've done it with fifth graders. Now, if you wanna know the research behind independent reading and why daily reading in school is effective and is important, go ahead and check out my blog post. I've linked some of the research or just Google it because there are studies and studies and studies about that prove that time spent reading is effective in raising reading achievement, comprehension, fluency, word recognition, all of it, vocabulary, everything. But I have never changed that decision, even though I've changed just about everything else in the last 21 years. I've never changed my mind because of Amy. Amy was one of my third graders and I was lucky enough to be working in a school that valued independent reading and valued guided reading. And so I was very supported as I was setting up my guided reading groups. And Amy was an ELL student who'd spoken another language until she came to school. So at the beginning of third grade, she was really only, had, she had really only been learning English for about three years. And she was reading at an end of first grade, beginning of second grade reading level, which is really pretty good. One day, I was sitting there with my high reading group, and they were reading a fourth grade level text, The Whipping Boy by Sid Fleischman, great book. And I noticed that for her independent reading choice, Amy had The Whipping Boy. And the next day, I noticed that she had chosen to sit in a spot close by so she could hear our conversation as I was discussing the book with the group. And she kept doing that day after day. And so one day I just called her and I said, hey, I didn't know you're reading The Whipping Boy. And she said, yeah. And I said, well, how are you doing with it? And I expected her to say, oh, it's really hard because it was about two years beyond her reading level. And she said, I like it. And I said, okay, well, would you like to join our reading group? And she said, yeah. And I said, but you still need to go to your other group and keep up with the work on that group. I was really convinced that she needed to be instructed at her instructional level. And fourth grade was not her instructional level. She agreed. And she came and she sat with us and she finished that book and she finished her instructional level book too. And a few weeks later, I did my um, assessments as I was doing so I could reshuffle my groups. And my jaw just about dropped when I was testing Amy because she had grown about a year and a half in about three weeks. And I thought, oh, something is wrong here. I had a friend reassess her. I'm like, you gotta, you gotta do, I think I messed up somehow on the test. I, 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 this can't be accurate. Sure enough, Amy had grown that much. Now, why did Amy grow? Well, there's a whole bunch of reasons why. Um, you can definitely read um, Shanahan's work and, and talking about stretch texts. That was a key thing for Amy. That was a stretch text for her and it brought enormous benefits. But I also think that there were some really important components to this. First of all, 
Thankfully, I had set up a classroom where Amy could choose her books. So a highly motivated student like Amy, she went for it. Now I understand not every student has Amy's motivation. We wish they did, but they don't. So does independent reading work for all students, not just the Amy's of the world? Absolutely, it does. The other day I was having a conversation with my daughter. She's just now finishing up her first season in basketball and she loves it. Now, she has never played basketball before, so she's still working on the basics, dribbling, layups, basics, right? So we were talking about what is she gonna do now in the off season to get better before the next season starts. And as we're having this conversation, I realized that not once did I say to her, hey, we should get some basketball worksheets. We should have you analyze all the steps and write down a summary of what you do when you do a layup. I didn't ever come up with that as an idea. We talked about watching videos on YouTube. We talked about reading books about basketball and strategy. We talked about getting out there and shooting. We talked about doing it. We did not talk about doing worksheets about it. That's my point. When you have precious little time, what would you rather have your students do? Practice the skill you want them to have, which is reading, or do worksheets about the skills you wish they had. I'd go for a book every time. Now, of course, there are some things you have to do to make it effective, and we'll cover those in other posts. But I want to talk to you just briefly about two more reasons why independent reading is probably never going to disappear from my classroom. Number one, it is an amazing time to build critical thinking skills, right? Not just reading achievement, but critical thinking skills. About 15 years ago, I read another really amazing book by Robert Marzano. You, if you know Marzano, you know he does meta-analysis of all the things out there that work. And in this particular book, his hypothesis was that we needed to build background knowledge for academic achievement. And he talked about that as schema and vocabulary. There is nothing better for building schema and vocabulary than wide reading. So that's one of the things we're gonna keep talking about is how do you get kids to read widely? Not just stuck in Captain Underpants. Captain Underpants is fine. It's a vacation book. It's gonna make you laugh. It is hilarious, but we can't stick there. We can't stay there and just eat a diet of Captain Underpants. It's like eating Donald cheeseburgers every day, right? Yummy, but not good for you. So I keep independent reading in my classroom because it builds critical thinking skills. And the other thing, and I think this is especially important this year coming off of a pandemic, we're gonna have some social emotional needs. They've always been there, they, they really have, but this year they're gonna be different. We're gonna have kids feeling more isolated, kids that are struggling to connect, kids that have lost friendships, kids that have suffered grief. We're gonna have some kids with some deep social emotional needs. Throughout my life, one of the biggest ways that I have found solace and comfort in times of grief and trouble is through books. And not only that, not only are they good for comforting us, but books have helped me become a better person. I've learned compassion through books. I've gained confidence through books. I've learned what it's like to be different people and gained empathy through books. I can't walk all the walks that are out there, but through books, I can spend a few minutes in somebody else's shoes. If you don't believe me, just read The Other Side by Jacqueline Winston. If you don't come away after reading that book with a deeper understanding of the racial divide that is in our country, with a deeper empathy for people on both sides, I'm not sure you read the book. <laughs> I think it's impossible to do that without gaining empathy and understanding. This year more than ever, our kids are going to need all of the gifts that reading can give them, including the social emotional benefits. So back to this planner, how on earth am I gonna fit it all in? Well, as I said at the beginning, 
we have to talk about taking things off the plate. And we are so bad at that as teachers. We're like, I've done this, I am comfortable with it, it fits my routine, and I'm just gonna keep on doing it, and somehow I'll squeeze some more things in. Well, eventually you just can't squeeze anything in, so you have to reevaluate. Some of the things you may want to reevaluate are worksheets, right? Just like the basketball example. You don't have your kids do worksheets about basketball. You have them get out there and do the skills and practice the layups. So what is more valuable? Helping a child build their capacity to read a text over time or having them do a worksheet where they identify the main idea? Can you take some of those worksheets off to gain more time reading? Maybe some of them stay, but some of them go. Another thing you may want to consider taking off the plate is some kind of any kind of computerized program or a reading incentive program like Accelerated Reader is one that's pretty widely used. If you really take a look at the research on that, there's very little research that those are effective. And when I say look at the research, don't look at the research put out there by the publishing company that's going to make money off of that. Look at something like the What Works Clearinghouse, where they've looked at all the studies and all the independent studies, so you know you can trust that that research is valid. And there's links to some of those on my blog post. You may also want to take off weekly spelling tests. Now, I'm not advocating that we should not teach spelling. We absolutely need to teach kids how words work, and that, is, that includes spelling for sure and for certain. However, weekly spelling tests where you give a list of 20, you do certain things, and then you give a test on Friday, that kind of traditional spelling has been proven over and over again to not be effective. It just simply does not transfer. And if you've ever done it, you know this because the next week, one of your kids will use that word in their writing and they'll spell it wrong. And you'll be like, you got it right on the test. You know it doesn't work. Can you take it off your plate? and use that time for something that does work. Because we know if kids are reading over and over and over again, they are building pictures in their minds of how words are spelled. What about rote language activities? How many times do you have kids get out a dictionary, look up the definition and copy it out? Now, I do believe that is valid and useful sometimes, but are you doing it too much? Maybe. What about daily oral language, where kids are looking at incorrectly spelled and incorrect grammar? That's really been proven to be not effective at helping kids edit and spell correctly. So can you take the daily oral language off? What other rote language activities have you just been holding on to, or your partner does them and so you do them, and you just maybe could evaluate that and take something off? to get something good. So hopefully you're going to be able to take a look at some of the practices that you've been doing and try to find some independent reading time. Research says 15 minutes of in-school time a day starts to get you benefits. Just 15 minutes. 15 minutes of time for kids to choose. I found 30. It was hard, but if you want to see my schedule, I put it in the blog post. This is my actual true to life schedule that I'm going to try and stick with this year. It's also important that, re that you know that research says that when kids are doing their independent reading, you are not reading and you are not answering emails. That is your small group instruction time. And when you think about it like that, and when you spin it to your principal like that, that doesn't sound so bad. So this year, I hope that you take 10 minutes to look at your schedule. Well, I know you'll take longer than that, but hopefully as you spend that time, you're going to be able to find, just start with 15 minutes and then maybe find 20 and slot in some independent reading time and see what it does for your kids. Thanks so much for watching. Happy teaching.